All right. Uh, thank you, folks, for coming. Uh, I am. I'm told that, that I've got to give a long disclaimer. Uh, this is this is for CMP Action Inc. Another reason I hate my federal government is that I have to read this, uh, but we have to. Uh, this session is sponsored by CMP Action Inc., the 501c4 sister organization of the Council for National Policy. CMP Action Inc. serves as an advocate for conservative principles such as limited government, the promotion of free economic enterprise, traditional values, and a strong national defense. CMP Action Inc. does not support candidates or political parties, but it may promote issues of specific pieces of legislation. Contributions to CMP Inc. are not tax deductible as charitable contributions. Did everybody get that? Thanks. Uh, <laughs> if you want more information on CMP Action Inc., Look at review the information in your packet. Um, I also want to thank the uh, United in Purpose and Bill Dallas for sponsoring this. Thank you, Bill. Where is Bill here? I don't know if Bill's here. Uh, but thank you to, to, um, see, to uh, United in Purpose. Uh, the goal of this action session is always to strategize on a given issue and to arrive at a unified path of action. The way we will do it is that each person will be giving a guest, will be giving a uh, presentation here. We're going to have a, a couple of videos we're going to show. Uh, as they speak, there are action items that they have selected. Um, they will be addressing those action items. We're doing it a little bit differently than we normally do it. Uh, at the end of which, uh, the, the Q&A period, um, we will have uh, wither down those action steps to three that will be presented uh, tomorrow night. We've added one little addition to this. I just asked Dr. Epstein if he would join us and when everyone finishes to give his observation. Not that he's going to agree. He may disagree, but that's always a good thing if he does. Uh, so um, I will begin. For first, uh, I will introduce the the uh, the the people who are joining us on the stage, I've just met a couple of them um, today. Uh, Marissa Sp uh, Strite, did I get it right? Rhymes with Sprite, yeah. but still Strite. That's how I got that. <laughs> um, uh, uh, she is a lady you are not to, to uh, mess with. Um, she lived in Israel and she served in the Military Intelligent Unit 8200 of the Israeli Defense Force. Um, she, is, she came to Los Angeles. She earned her bachelor's degree in business economics from UCLA and her master's degree in education and nonprofit management from American Jewish University. Uh, Marissa is uh, the CEO of, of PragerU. Uh, PragerU has become a force of nature in the conservative movement overnight, uh, and I think Marissa uh, is responsible for that. Uh, Craig Strazeri is the chief marketing officer at PragerU. Uh, he joined PragerU in 2015 and leads the organization's branding, marketing, and overall growth efforts. Um, Craig has dramatically, in look at this number, um, PragerU's online audience is now, is now reaching 80 million Americans in the past year, with over 60% of them being under the age of 35. Everybody says you have to reach young people. PragerU is doing it. Rachel Bovard, she has so many titles and she's done so many things, she's intimidating the hell out of me. Um, she serves as Senior Advisor to the Internet Accountability Project, Senior Policy Advisor at the Conservative Partnership Institute, and a Fellow at Defense Priority. She's worked for a number of different organizations, including the Heritage Foundation. In 2013, she was named one of the National Journal's most influential women under the age of 35. She's been everywhere on television. You've seen her, and she's a prolific uh, and a beautiful writer uh, on, who's written for the Washington Examiner, Daily Wire, The Hill, Real uh, Clear Politics, and many others. So as you see, you've got three very accomplished people to, to speak on this subject. Um, okay, so, so introductory comments from me. I think it is a, a real tribute to the CMP and to CMP action that we were discussing the beginning of this issue long before anybody was. Um, the issue being censorship of the American people. I think, and, and I will argue, that this is the single most important topic that will be discussed at all of CMP 
this weekend for the simple reason that this topic affects every single person in the conservative movement. This is not something that's affecting just your organization. It's not just affecting a political leader, a policy leader. What we're talking about is the censorship of thought itself, where you are allowed to think and say certain things, and not allowed to say and, and, and think certain things. I'm gonna run a video that was done uh, with Prager University, that, that we did with Prager University. Before running it, I just, some of these numbers are gonna pop up, but I really want you to focus on these things. How powerful social media is today. Facebook, 2.2, 2.3 billion fans worldwide. Twitter, 300 and some million uh, users of it, and it does things like elect president of the United States. YouTube, five billion downloads a day. Google, 62,000 searches per second. There's never been a source and a power of information in the history of man as there is today. When those rules are applied, they are not applied to the United States. These are worldwide communities and they are applied worldwide. To give you a mindset on their thinking, there is for, better, uh, for lack of a better term, there's a European model and there's an American model. In the American model, they see freedom, for, we see freedom first, the Constitution, virtue second, what you do with your freedom. In the European model, they put virtue first and freedom second. Virtue, however, is defined as what they think is virtue. Adam Brandon today talked about how the left sees it as a civic duty to come out and vote against Donald Trump. Understand that what we're talking about here is a moral imperative as they see it, because they believe that not only are we wrong, but we are dangerous in some cases with things like climate denial um, and, and other issues, and we have to be stopped. That's why they are being as aggressive as they are. So the first thing we're gonna, we're gonna do is I'm gonna run a video that was done. Before running that thing, I wanna say something about Prager. Um, and, and how intimidating Prager University is. I, they asked me to, to produce a script for this video, and I did, and uh, it was a collaborative thing with a lot of staff people, it was, and it was very, very good. And we sent it back, and I mean, it really was good. And uh, a few days later, came back the response, and, you know, that was very good, but how about this? And I looked at that, and I ripped up mine, and we went immediately with that, they're that good. I will say about Prager, that in 40 years, and I'm gonna go on a limb here, um, when it comes to, to producing product, producing video, they are the absolute best I have ever seen. How about them apples? Okay, so uh, let's run the first video that it talks about the censorship issue. The year is 1984. One company, Microsoft, dominates the computer world. It's their way or the highway, conform or die. This snapshot in time was perfectly captured in one of the most famous commercials in TV history. Set in the gray dystopian future, row after row of men stare blankly at a giant screen from which Big Brother, the all-powerful leader from George Orwell's classic novel 1984, addresses them. Suddenly, riot police burst into the hall chasing a beautiful blonde woman in a white shirt and red shorts. Before they can grab her, she hurls a sledgehammer into the screen, shattering Big Brother and his grip on the masses. The narrator informs us that Apple's breakthrough product, the Macintosh computer, will be the device that sets us all free. Looking back, Apple largely lived up to its promise. A new wave of companies, each in its own way, followed the example set by Apple's legendary CEO, Steve Jobs. Google gave us instant access to vast amounts of information. Facebook gave us a new way to connect with friends, family, and the world. Twitter brought this world to us in real time. And YouTube allowed anyone with a smartphone to become a virtual broadcast network onto themselves. It was glorious and empowering. But that was yesterday. 
Today, it's 1984 all over again. Big Brother is back with an important twist. Our former liberators now want to be our masters. Apple, Google, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, the giants of social media, are demanding conformity to their values. It's their way or the highway. Conform or die. This image is perfectly captured, not by an ad, but by this recent real-life scene. Row after row of men and women stare up at Tim Cook, Apple's CEO, as he makes a presentation, ironically, before a civil rights group. We only have one message for those who seek to push hate, division, and violence. You have no place on our platforms, Cook tells his audience. You have no home here. Hate? Division? According to whom? The answer is obvious. According to Apple, Google, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, they are becoming the big brother Orwell foresaw. Conform or die. Cook's ideas are exactly the same as his fellow chief executives at Google, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Disagree with Big Brother on, say, politics or morality, and Big Brother will shut you up by shutting you down. And what is it that Big Brother doesn't like? Well, Tim Cook said it. Anything that doesn't conform to his left-wing worldview. The examples are numerous and growing. Megan Murphy, a Canadian feminist, is permanently banned from Twitter for refusing to refer to the transgendered by their preferred pronoun and for writing, women aren't men. Google, Facebook, and Twitter all at various times refused to carry political ads from Tennessee Republican candidate Marsha Blackburn promoting her conservative views. She's hardly the only one this has happened to. And as many of you know, YouTube continues to restrict over 100 of Prager U's videos, finding them inappropriate for children. These include titles like, Why Did America Fight the Korean War? Broad-based studies by the American Institute for Behavioral Research and Technology and by Northwestern University have confirmed what these examples clearly suggest, bias against conservatives at Google and other big tech sites. And this is the bias we can plainly see, what we don't see, what Big Brother hides from us, what is referred to as shadow banning, may be even more pernicious. If you're on the left, maybe you're okay with this, but if you're not on the left, or even if you are and you revere the First Amendment, you should be concerned, very concerned. We are advancing swiftly toward an Orwellian 1984 world of stifling one way of thinking conformity. This time, it's not a fictional story. It's real. What's the solution? Simply return to the open market of ideas that served big tech so well for so long. Stop the censorship and let people make up their own minds. Otherwise, America and the rest of what has been known as the free world will cease to be free. That's how serious the big tech threat is. I'm Brent Bozell, founder of the Media Research Center for Prager University. Thank there, you we're done. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> see how good they are? See how, see how, good, see how good they are? Um, okay, so, so Marissa and Craig are going to take it from here with their presentation. Okay. Uh, it's okay if I stand up? So, hi, everyone. I'm Marissa. Uh, I'm, I was going to say a few words about myself, but I'm not, never going to say what Brent said about me. So I'm just going to leave it as that because it's, it sounds a lot better than what I would say about myself. But thank you. Thanks for everything you said. Uh, I do want to give a shout out to Craig because he's not going to talk about how awesome he is and his team are. And your whole, our whole lives, we've wished we had a massive media conservative company. Always, we've said to ourselves, if we could only do a better job sharing conservative ideas with young people, if we only knew how to better market our ideas, because our ideas are better, we've just not been very good at marketing them. Craig's team is responsible for that marketing component of PragerU. The three billion views that we got to date, the fact that 60% of our audience on YouTube is under the age of 34, that is something that I have to give credit to Craig and his team, and he'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but a major achievement for us. Uh, 
you describe me as scary. Uh, <laughs> maybe, I don't know if I would say that I'm scary, but uh, I'm very serious about our work, and we are very dangerous when it comes to fighting back against the left, and that has been really our goal. Uh, but I'm going to tell you a little bit of a less of a scary story about me. So I'm a mom of three. I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. Um, and for those of you who remember those days, uh, we have a lot of play dates. Uh, so my five-year-old, Olivia, had this little girl, Zoe, uh, come over last weekend, and the two of them you know, pulled out a bunch of crayons, and they were drawing, and uh, Zoe looked so serious. I said, Zoe, what are you doing with these crayons? You're like so focused on this piece of paper. And uh, Zoe, Zoe looks at me, and she says, oh, uh, I'm drawing God. And I'm like, wow, Zoe, you're drawing God? How do you know? Nobody knows what God looks like. And then she looks back at me and she says, well, they will in a minute. <laughs> Which I thought was just so adorable. And then I, I told Craig about it this week. And then Craig wanted me to bring this piece of paper of what she drew. And then I said, no, God doesn't want us to know what God looks like. It's, it's a lot better this way, right? So uh, I, figured, I figured you all appreciate that moment. But I'm really, I'm, I'm sharing this story with you uh, because, you see, Dennis Prager has taught us at PragerU that humans crave two basic things, food and meaning. And young people need meaning. And when you rob them of religion and you rob them of community and family, then they find meaning in a lot of other bad things. And you're seeing that on the internet. And PragerU really stepped in in a time where people needed meaning. The videos that we make, they're not just political. We make a lot of videos also on meaning and how to have a better life and, have, and, and how to bring religion into our, better, into our lives. And some of our most impactful videos are the videos that we make on religion. Guess what our most hated videos are? The ones that we make on religion. And one of our videos, one of the videos that are, by the way, the, an update is 100 videos were, were censored at the time that we filmed you. Since then, now 200 videos are censored. And many of them are the videos on religion. It makes no sense. Our videos are supposedly hate speech, pornographic, or incite violence. One of our videos, a video from the Ten Commandments, presented by Dennis Prager, is censored. And the video is censored, why, according to YouTube? Because it has the word murder in it, as in, you shall not murder. And that video is censored. So these are, these are scary times. These are really scary times. And one of the things that we're going to do today, Craig and I, is prove to you if you have any doubt whether there is conservative censorship, or if you have friends at home that have doubt whether or not there is conservative censorship, we're going to give you eight specific examples so you can see in your own eyes that conservative censorship exists. And trust me, our videos are not pornographic. OK? You would agree to that, right? <laughs> I so they were. I, <laughs> I also, I also want to say that some of you here might tune out and say, well, you know, there are a few people under the age of 34 here who can deal with this, but I'm maybe over the age of 34 by a couple of years, and the internet is not really my thing, and social media is really not my thing, and that's somebody else's problem or, in, in, or somebody else's niche. To this, I will answer that if freedom is your thing, then social media is your thing. Because if we can't get to young people and to people in general through social media, we will lose America as we know it. We will. So today, we're going to teach you what you need to know, the very basics, so that you can go back to other people and say, yeah, I'm not a social media expert, but I know these eight specific examples that prove that conservative okay. censorship is out there. And today, we're also going to give you specific action items of what you can do, even if, censor, even if social media is not your thing. Very simple things that you can do, along with whatever Brigitte assigned to you for Saturday mornings. We're, we're going to give you an additional assignment of something that you can do. So on to this first slide. Uh, these are <clears throat> the basic eight things that Craig and I are going to cover. So we can go to the next slide. 
OK, so this is what restricted mode looks like. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is the general video censorship. And what do I mean by that? So I'm just going to have my slides here, so I don't have to look back. So what do we mean by, by censorship? Are all the 200 videos that we're talking about taken down from the internet? No, that is not the case. So first of all, PragerU uploads the videos that we make on our own channels. Our, chan our own channels are controlled by us, and they're not censored. However, our whole goal is to reach new audiences, not ones that are already conservative and agree with us and subscribe to us and visit PragerU.com. We want to reach new audiences. And to do that, we have to go onto social media. So even if we create our own platform that cannot be censored, the whole goal of reaching the undecided, what we call that 33% of the PragerU audience that doesn't know where they fit, the only way to reach them is to use digital social media because that's where they already are. So PragerU advertises these videos and posts these videos on social media platforms like YouTube. And if a student wants to see it on college campus, or at a place of work where they will likely turn on the restricted mode on because they don't want students to watch pornography in college libraries or in high school libraries, this is what they will find if they try to see one of those 200 censored videos. Now you might say to yourselves, well, maybe they're restricting the same type of content in general, that is from a left-wing point of view, which is what they claim. They say, well, we're not only uh, restricting PragerU content uh, because it's conservative, same content on the other side is also restricted. All right, so I don't want you to leave with any doubt on that. We've made a collection of videos that are being censored, made by YouTube, and videos that are on the exact same topic, oftentimes the exact same titled, that are not, not only not being censored, but oftentimes even promoted on YouTube. So take a look at that. YouTube, which is owned by Google, is censoring over 200 PragerU videos. Their claim is that our videos violate their community guidelines. Really? Are they pornographic? Hateful? Do they incite violence? Of course not. Take a look at the stark comparison of the videos that we put out versus videos that are out there on YouTube that are currently not restricted. Let's talk about one of the most emotionally charged subjects there is, abortion, but in an unemotional way. Pro-life lawmakers are like Confederate Civil War reenactors, a group of angry old white men who get together and try and relive the glory days, no matter how unrealistic. Intersectionality is a form of identity politics in which the value of your opinion depends on how many victim groups you belong to. Black women endure both gender discrimination and racial discrimination. Over the last 30 years, scholars, educators, and activists have expanded the use of the word intersectionality to talk about identities beyond race and gender. If we do in fact support political, social, and religious freedom, then we cannot in good conscience give Islam a free pass on the grounds of multicultural sensitivity. We need to say to Muslims living in the West, if you want to live in our societies, to share in their material benefits, then you need to accept that our freedoms are not optional. Hijab in Arabic means to cover. It normally refers to a piece of fabric that some women use to cover their hair. Hijab is a concept. It's meant to kind of promote modesty. For me, putting on a headscarf was emancipation because that was the moment that I reclaimed my identity. They say, hey peeps, I'm a Muslim, what's up? When I was the Prime Minister of Canada, I was often asked this question, why do you support Israel? My response, in effect, was always the same. Why wouldn't I support Israel? Why wouldn't I support a fellow democratic nation where open elections, free speech, and religious tolerance are the everyday norm? When Trump says that Israel is one of the great democracies in the world, I would say that's the biggest bullshit I've ever had. When I hear that Christians in the West are helping Israel, thinking that they are helping Christians in Palestine, I think, uh, they're mistaken. 
Israel is who to blame. They took everything, man. They took all your life since you were a child. America is now the least racist white majority society in the world, has a better record of legal protections of minorities than any other society, white or black, offers more opportunities to a greater number of black persons than any other society, including all of those of Africa. You look at Black Lives Matter, and they're standing in that tradition. They're trying to finish the unfinished business of the fact that we have mass incarceration of African Americans, that you have police officers who murder black people on the streets of the United States in 2016. If you're still a fan of Marxism after all the death, suffering, and destruction it's caused, that's your right. But own up to it. Don't hide behind the, it's never really been tried line. It has. What exactly is socialism? Well, in its most simple form, socialism is when a population collectively owns and controls the means of production and distributes the end result proportionally. Socialist democracies are the happiest countries in the world. You just watched a sampling of PragerU videos that are being restricted versus videos that are on YouTube that are not being restricted. Same topics, oftentimes same titles, their videos are not restricted. Is it ideological bias? I think the answer is obvious. Okay, so you'd imagine the shock we felt when we suddenly realized that our videos were being restricted. In all honesty, we thought it was a mistake at first. Uh, and I'm going to let Craig describe to you what happened once we started realizing that there was censorship of, of our content. Yeah, so uh, I remember the day actually vividly. It was in 2016, and Marissa came running into my office and said, we just got this email from a student who said she watched the PragerU video at home and wanted to show it to her friends, and she was at her university, college campus, school library, and tried to pull up the video to show her friend, and it was restricted. Just didn't come up, didn't exist. And like Marissa just said, this has to be a mistake. I mean, why would our PragerU video, and I think this particular one was on the Korean War, the history of the Korean War with Victor Davis Hanson. How could that possibly be restricted as, as inappropriate content? So we started looking into it and reaching out to YouTube to find out how could this be? Is it a bad algorithm? Must be a mistake. And uh, if any of you have ever tried to get a hold of like a cable company or health insurance, this was 10 times worse, this process. It was a total nightmare trying to get anyone to respond back or anything other than a very boilerplate email, very vague response that we'll look into it and get back to in six to eight weeks. So we just got kind of pushed aside, but we are fighters at PragerU, as you'll learn, and we just kept asking. We want to know why this video and why what we found at the time 16 videos are restricted. After, keep, after we kept pushing, we finally got this email back from them. So you'll see this was a few years ago in 2016. It says, thanks for writing back. As mentioned in the previous emails at this time, your videos are not appropriate for younger audiences, and hence they're not appearing in restricted mode search results. I'd recommend you go through our community guidelines and align them with the content to see where it's violated. This is what sent us over the edge. We're like, so Google in writing telling us that our videos are not appropriate for young audiences when, as many of you have seen a few PragerU videos, they're very educational and appropriate. So we said we got to do something about this. We can't just let this be. We got to fight back. Um, so one of the first things we did is we started telling the public. And, and as you'll hear more, spreading public awareness on this issue is just as important uh, as our legal and, uh, battle in our lawsuit. So we launched an online petition. Uh, and how many of you in this room have signed our YouTube petition? OK, that's great. But the rest of you can also sign it at PragerU.com slash YouTube. Uh, and it's one of the action items that you'll hear from us later. So, one million Americans have already signed this petition, and we really want to keep this going to send YouTube a really strong message that whether or not you agree with all of our videos, and we get emails all the time from people who say, I don't agree with a lot of your videos, but the fact that your videos on the Ten Commandments or your history videos are being restricted is, is just absurd. So I'm going to sign the petition, and I'm going to support you. So those, those letters are really motivating and inspiring for us to, to get. And the fact that one million Americans have signed this petition 
it, it shows how many Americans really do care about free speech, and it also shows the importance of spreading public awareness on this issue, because we can do so much through the legal courts, but we gotta, we got to influence the public. The public still trusts Google, and we've got to break that trust with Google, which is a big part of what we're trying to do. So I'm going to give you a, a couple other examples in addition to the video censorship and video restrictions. Um, as Marissa mentioned, we're gonna, we have a total of eight. So this is Dave Rubin. Uh, and for those who are not familiar, he's not a conservative. He identifies himself as a classical liberal. He did a PragerU video called Why I Left the Left, which explains why he left the left. and got, uh, It's one of our most watched videos, over 20 million views. And so Dave noticed uh, a, a few years ago that his followers and subscribers on YouTube we're going backwards. And he says, this doesn't seem right. I mean, uh, every day, and he would check, they would be going up and up and up. And then one day he noticed they were going backwards by 5,000, 10,000, 20,000. And it looked like his, his subscribers were being purged. So he, he called up Marissa and I and said, hey, can, what's going on? Do you guys know anything about this? Have you noticed this on your channel? So we started looking at it, and we started to see a pattern. And I can tell you this, to this day, not a day goes by where PragerU does not receive an email saying, I was following you on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. I never unsubscribed from your channel, and now I'm unsubscribed from your channel. So this is along the lines of shadow banning, and it's hard to track, hard to pr uh, catch them in the act, but it's happening not just to conservatives like PragerU, but to classical liberals like Dave Rubin, who's appeared on our platform and might have had something to do with it. Another example, if this will go, there we go. This is a new development and a very scary one. It's YouTube themselves trying to refute our videos and other videos on YouTube. So when it comes to climate change or global warming, we had this video with an MIT professor, Richard Lindzen, explaining his thoughts on climate change. YouTube puts right below the video a, a rebuttal on the facts about climate change. So they're going out of their way. So they, they, they claim they're a platform for all public forum, but they're going out of their way to refute the ideas in our videos and tell the viewers, the video you're watching may not be true. Here are the facts. So this is actually really scary and trouble, troubling that they're really going out of their way to do this. Uh, yet another example. As a lot of you heard from Dr. Epstein in, in uh, his talk earlier today and his brilliant research, uh, search manipulation is is so big and so scary, so frightening, and we probably don't even know uh, the most of it or, or any of it really at all. Uh, this was just an example of the autofill of PragerU is, when you type that in, you see lying, bias, dangerous, owned by oil companies, garbage, trash. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's us. We're proud of it. It's a, bra it's a badge of honor. We'll take it. <laughs> uh, another example of, of YouTube um, uh, and big tech censorship. They constantly claim, and sometimes in a rebuttal to our lawsuit, which we'll talk more about in a bit, that, oh, we also restrict videos of other channels who are you know, politically on the left. Yet, they just recently sent the Young Turks, and if you don't know who the Young Turks are, they're about the most progressive, socialist, left-wing YouTube channel. They, YouTube, are funding them in the six figures to run a new news channel to reach young people with their ideas. And they promote socialism, anti-American ideas. And so YouTube continues to lie, pretend that they're politically neutral and not politically biased. They're sending them hundreds of thousands of dollars. We've never got a check like that from YouTube. That's, uh, that I can assure you. Shadow banning. Marissa is going to talk about this one. Yeah, so we're actually running out of time. So if you want to learn more about shadow banning, you can come to us afterwards. Uh, I'll end with a couple of things since I need to fast forward. Here's what we're doing. So a couple of years ago, we filed a lawsuit. Uh, it was just recently dismissed by the Ninth Circuit. Our state court is still uh, a live uh, component of what we're doing. There's a big problem because the legal system is not set up to properly interpret the law of the internet and section 230 is, uh, is uh, of the CDA of the Consumer Decency Act is really making it very difficult for us to win in court. Uh, PragerU's job is to win in the court of public opinion. We've made incredible inwards on that side, uh, but there's a lot more work to do on, uh, on that front, and part of what we need help with is in these action items that we'll present to you later, uh, where you can help us in, in the court of, of public opinion, which is just as important as the court of law. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you, Craig. Rachel? Yeah, give them a round, give them a round of applause. Give them a round of applause. Just got to switch the PowerPoints. Um, well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks again for coming. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about 
you know, what do we do now, right? What should our policy response to be to what's happening uh, with Google and with YouTube? And by the way, I think people sometimes forget Google owns YouTube. Okay, Google owns half the internet. Google is on the top 80 million sites on the internet. So you may not even be thinking about anything uh, when you're on ESPN.com, but Google's watching you. Okay, and that goes to a little bit of what I'm gonna talk about. So when we talk about Google, hi, okay. Um, I wanna sort of lay uh, the this, this state of play for what we're dealing with. Um, I'm gonna talk about these four things. Google's market dominance, I'm gonna bust some myths about how you cannot opt out and you cannot build your own, and then I'm gonna tell you why you shouldn't trust Google in the first place. Um, Dr. Epstein mentioned this in the creepy line. Uh, this is the comment from a former Google CEO, Eric Schmidt. We don't need you to type. We know where you are. We know where you've been. We more or less know what you're thinking about. That is Google's policy and consumer and commercial goal. Okay? So starting from there, this is how big Google is. Okay? They are 76% of the worldwide mobile search, 93% of the market on search, 70% of the web browser market, and 77% of the market for online streaming, and that's YouTube. Okay? We talk a lot about, in, in conservative spaces, how we want there to be a free market, we want there to be competition. I want all those things too, but let me tell you, give you an example of, of a search engine that had all of the best minds, billions of dollars, to try and compete with Google. For several years they did this. That search engine was Bing. It has 2% of the market share. Okay, and the reason it will never compete with Google, no matter how good it is, is because of the way algorithms work. Okay, someone probably has built a better algorithm than Google, but algorithms refine and get better because of data. And Bing will never have the data that Google has because Google has search, it dominates search, it has YouTube, it has Chrome, it has all these different things, and it's getting all of this data from all of these platforms. Their dominance in data is, is untouchable. Okay, so even if you have a better algorithm, it will never be able to compete because it doesn't have the data dominance. Okay? You cannot opt out of Google, as I mentioned. Uh, Google tracks you across the internet. It's on the top 80 million sites on the internet. Um, it reads your email, if you have Gmail. Uh, your Android phone will track you even when your phone's location is off, and I'll show you an example of this in a minute. And Google recently purchased the health data of 28 million Fitbit users in addition to something called Project Nightingale, which you may have heard about, the Wall Street Journal broke this a couple of months ago, hospital chains across the country are now providing Google with your full medical record, name, date of birth, uh, health history, um, the drugs that you're taking, without the knowledge of the patient or doctor, or their consent. They're doing this under HIPAA. HIPAA, the law that doesn't allow me to get a medical condition on my grandmother because I'm not her spouse, somehow allows Google to have all this information about you. That seems like a policy problem. Uh, so this is, if you have an Android phone, which Google owns, this is the type of data it is collecting on you when your phone is off. You can see how detailed it gets. It can tell when you wake up, it can tell if you're walking, it knows where you are. Again, this is collected when the phone was off. When you turn the phone back on, all this data went right to Google servers. Okay, so opting out of Google is very difficult. I don't have an Android phone, I have an Apple phone, but Android is the most popular phone in the world because it's cheaper. Okay, but it's still on my Apple phone, Google Maps is built into almost every app that you own. So you're not getting away from Google. You wanna use Uber, you're on Google. You wanna use Amazon, well Amazon owns half the internet, you're also on Google. Anything that involves your location, you are on Google. So good luck opting out. Um, I think I touched on this, but this is everything Google knows about your health data. Why do they want this? They were asked. They said, we take privacy very seriously. Thanks, I'm comforted. Okay, they won't tell you why, but keep in mind that Google makes all of its money by targeted advertising. All right, based on the data on the apps that they have uh, data collection on, Google oftentimes knows when a woman is pregnant before she's told anyone in her family. She will then receive targeted ads for baby supplies and hospitals and all these things. You're on a new diabetes medication? Google knows that because they have your health record. Guess what targeted ads you're gonna receive? Any medical condition that you don't want people to know about, Google knows, and it's going to send you targeted ads. This is very likely what they're trying to do with this data. 
Now, I've talked about this, about Google's insurmountable, insurmountable advantage is its data collection. It's shared between all of its platforms. The closest competitor had every advantage that we say in the free market should matter, right? They had money, they had the best brains in the business, and they had you know, massive scale, and they got 2%. Okay, and again, that's because of the data dominance of Google. This isn't a normal market. Um, to the point that there's not really a free market in tech anymore, uh, this is why. Uh, you cannot actually compete uh, with these companies. They will take you out at the knees. Actually, Google and Oracle are fighting a case about this. It's going to be heard in the Supreme Court on March 24th. And it talks about Google just stealing Oracle's 11,500 lines of code to build their Android phone. This is a pattern of behavior for Google. If you are a smaller competitor, they swipe your IP, and then they say, oh, yeah, come sue us. How many companies, small businesses, do you think have the resources to spend 10 years fighting Google? None. Oracle's the exception because they're also really big. But Sonos, the speaker maker, if anyone has Sonos, just sued Google over this as well. They said, oh, they stole our speaker IP, or our uh, speaker blueprints and used them in Google Home. Their founder, Patrick uh, Denis, no, sorry, I can't remember his name. Anyway, he basically said, look, we, we have a, a litigation against Amazon too. We can only af afford to fight one big tech company at a time. So we're going after Google. We may not make it, but we thought the principle was right. Now, a couple of things to talk about. There's three policy responses I think are really important here. Um, the first is antitrust. There is currently an antitrust investigation going on with 50 state attorneys general. Now, if 50 state AGs can agree on something, there's probably enough smoke that there's a fire, <laughs> okay? They are investing, investigating Google on the digital advertising front. I'm not gonna get into this market because it's very complicated, but the Wall Street Journal has done a ton of good reporting on it. But Google owns the entirety of the digital advertising space. And if you want to advertise on any of these platforms, meaning if you want to reach any kind of consumer, you are forced to use Google products. So the 50 state AGs are, are investigating this. They're led by Ken Paxton out of Texas. My action item is going to be for all of you to support what they're doing. Okay? Antitrust is law enforcement. As conservatives, you know, a lot of people will say, well, antitrust is wrong. We need to let the market bear out. Antitrust is law enforcement. Unlike the left, who's already determined what the outcome of this investigation will be, the Elizabeth Warrens of the world who say, we need to do this and we need to break them up. This is an investigation. As conservatives, we say trust but verify. This is that verification process. So we need to support the AGs in this effort. Google's already going after Ken Paxton personally. He's been the subject of numerous personal attacks. If any of you know him, he's a good man and he needs to be allowed to do his job. And so we need to support them in that effort. The, section is to, the second is to update or reform Section 230. Now, Marissa talked about this briefly. Section 230 is in the Communications Decency Act, a law that was passed in 1996, before any of these companies even really existed at scale. Okay, there's two key parts of Section 230. One says, no tech company will be considered a publisher. And the second is the liability shield. It said, if you wanna take down smutty content, pornography, uh, exploitative work, you can't be sued for that. In reality, that's probably a good thing, right? We want them to police bad content on the internet. That's why it's called the Good Samaritan provision. But what has happened is that the courts have, it's become a judicially interpreted statute so far afield of its original intent that that liability shield is now bulletproof. It allows these platforms to censor conservatives. And what happened with, with the PragerU case is that it's become so bulletproof that we can't even litigate on the censorship grounds because the liability shield means it just gets tossed out of court. Okay, this is not what the original intent of the statute was. It's designed to remove pornography from the internet, to remove terrorism uh, recruitment videos from the internet. Now, it's funny when you, you hear some conservatives talk about this, they say, oh, if you get rid of Section 230, pornography will be everywhere. Guys, I don't know if you've been on the internet recently. Pornography is everywhere, okay? Section 230, the reason it's not effective is because it it's the Good Samaritan provision, right? It allows them to censor content. It doesn't punish them if they don't, right? So it's a Good Samaritan provision that allows them to walk by uh, the stranger in the ditch and keep on walking and do nothing about it. And, it. and in reality, it also allows them to censor conservatives with impunity. This statute needs to be reformed. Now, Congress has to do it. We can keep suing in court, and we're not going to win because of what the courts have done. Congress needs to step in and do this. There's a myriad of proposals uh, to do this. In the follow-up email, I think Sherry's going to send out a couple of articles I've written about it. Some other people have written about it. 
Congress needs to debate and step in and do this. And then finally, data as a property right. When we talk about big tech, they like to refer to us as the user. We aren't the user. We are the commodity. Our data makes them money. So why don't we own it? Why, if PragerU's on YouTube making billions of dollars for YouTube and their content is restricted or stripped, why aren't they being compensated for that? It's, it's, they've created it. They're making money. And so this is something that we need to talk about. Data portability is the concept of being able to take your data to a different platform. If you remember when the cell phone users, or, or the cell phone companies, the, or the telephone companies, I'm a millennial, can you tell? I don't remember landlines, really. They're all cell phone companies. Uh, they allowed you to take your phone number with you. It made everything different, right? Because all of a sudden, Verizon had to compete for me, so I didn't go to AT&T. Okay? If we allow the platforms to compete for our data, that's actually a market. There's a market. These concerns about privacy and censorship could actually be competed away at that point. Okay, but that doesn't exist right now. So all of this, the last two in particular, are action items for Congress. And the first is an, is a, an, it, an action item for the states. But all of us need to be talking to Congress about these things. So we can get into that a little bit more in the action items. But thank you. Thank, thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to ask you, because we're, we're, we're behind a little bit, if you could just race through the, the, uh, the recommendations you're making. That we have on a, we have them on a screen on the screen here, and just just you know walk us through them very very quickly, and then we're going to discuss them. Can we get them up. Okay, so public awareness. So first of all, you can go to PragerU.com. You can use your phone, and sign our petition. Why is this petition important? Because mon numbers matter. The more people know that the more people care about this issue, the more people will sign, up, sign our petition and start talking about it. It also helps us when we can show YouTube that people actually care about what they're doing. So it should be just an easy two minute step, sign the petition and get as many people as you can to sign the petition. So we wanna engage all of you in the public awareness component of PragerU. The next one is, I'm giving you an assignment. This is homework by PragerU to please share Brent Bozell's video with at least 50 people. So if you have 50 people in your email list that you can just take the video and send it to and say, hey friend, I want to get you thinking about this because something needs to be done. Again, we need to shutter people's trust in Google. That's the biggest issue. Everybody thinks that Google is the number one most trusted company in the world. It's absurd. Okay, so. All of you, we need you to be ambassadors to bring this information to the world. And three is, well, again, this is part of the awareness. So if you go to PragerU.com, you can see how you can support us. And then we have a, a few additional action items that has, have to do with Section 230, but it's really the same thing as what Rachel is talking about. Uh, Section 230 of the CDA is a big, big problem for us to win. Um, so I'll let Ra Rachel, you can cover it much, much better, but you know, we feel like our hands are handcuffed. How do we win this lawsuit if, if uh, the judges don't know enough about the internet, don't really know how to, uh, how to make decisions about it, and they basically say, well, you know, somebody above us made a decision that they get to eat the cake and have it too, so therefore, uh, you know, every lawsuit, every violation, every breach of contact, contract that YouTube does with conservatives gets protected under this Section 230 of the CDA. And we need to figure out a way to fight it. Thank you, Marissa. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Epstein, we'll open it up for questions in a second, if he would like to give an observation on what he's heard. How long do we have? Uh, 30 seconds. No, just, <laughs> you, know, no give, you know, give it a couple of minutes. How about that? OK. Um, <clears throat> You can disagree with us, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you all prayed for me, so I guess uh, that makes you friends. So um, I'll just say as a friend that um, with all due respect, you don't seem to understand how big this problem is. See, I have a lot of conservative friends who are very concerned about the censorship issue, and you're right. There really is censorship, suppression of conservative content. You're absolutely right. But because I'm nonpartisan for the most part, 
I get communications almost every day from socialists, from progressives, uh, alternative medicine people. I was just on Dr. Mercola's show. I don't, don't know if you know him who have been virtually shut down. Mercola lost more than 90% of his traffic all of a sudden, one day, all of a sudden, out of the blue. So the larger issue when it comes to censorship is not about conservatives, it's who gave these companies, this handful of executives, to decide what two and a half billion people around the world, and that number will soon exceed four billion, who gave them the right to decide what all of us around the world can see or cannot see? I'm sorry, that's not a conservative issue. That's an issue for humanity. Now, Rachel fortunately brought up the second big problem. The first big problem is censorship, and it's a very big issue. It's not a conservative issue, it's a huge issue. And by the way, if you go country by country, like you go to Cuba, for example, <clears throat> uh, they don't censor the conservatives. They censor people on the left. Google, I mean, censors people on the left in Cuba. And for those of you who know the politics of Cuba, you could probably explain why. It's pretty simple to figure out. So country by country, they do something different in each country. And Google, of course, has also worked closely with the government of China in suppressing the Chinese population. So you know, they, they censor whoever they want to censor. That's the big issue. Now, the second issue is indeed, as Rachel said, it is surveillance. Hey, that's, a, that's an issue in and of itself that is so large, so huge, and I don't think I, don't, I think barely anyone has, an, has an, a sense of how big this issue is. It's, it's not just your phones that are listening on, on everything, okay? A few years ago, Google bought the smart thermostat company called Nest. Well, <laughs> then they started putting microphones into the smart thermostats, and now they're putting microphones and cameras into the smart thermostats, and Google has been getting patent after patent issued on how to interpret sounds inside people's homes to determine whether or not the children are brushing their teeth enough, or maybe you need some help with your sex life, or maybe there's too much arguing. You have no idea the extent of the surveillance. It is not just objectionable, it's obscene. If you're concerned about that issue, please go to my online article, go to my7simplesteps.com. As I said earlier, for those of you who weren't there, I have not received a targeted ad since 2014. So there are other ways to use tech than the way Google and Facebook want you to use it. But the third area really wasn't even mentioned here. The third threat that these companies pose to humanity, I didn't really hear it mentioned. And that is manipulation. And the, the, the techniques that I have been discovering one by one by one now for over seven years, they are absolutely mind-boggling. And the people at these companies know all about them. And how do I know that? Because of the whistleblowers. Because now, lately, a lot of documents have leaked and videos have leaked. These, these techniques I've stumbled onto, these companies have always known about them, and they're using them strategically, deliberately. When I testified before Congress, Dennis Prager was in the same session testifying. That's the first time I ever met him. He's a great guy. I, I, he is. <laughs> <laughs> but right before us, Google's representative testified. And Google's representative was asked, under oath, do you folks have any blacklists at your company? And he said, no, Senator, we do not. Under oath, OK? A couple of months later, Zachary Voorhees, who had been a senior software engineer at Google for eight and a half years and I've gotten to know very well, walks out of the company, walks away from his $250,000 a year uh, job and all the stock benefits, walks out with 950 pages of documents and a video. Now, that's a video I wish you had shown, okay? 
First of all, among the documents were two of Google's blacklists. They're called blacklists. <laughs> That's really dumb, okay? <laughs> now, I published a big investigative piece in US News and World Report in 2016 called The New Censorship. And it was about nine of Google's blacklists, and I explained in detail how they worked. I had never seen them, but I knew, I know as a programmer, that they must exist. It took a couple of years before actual Google blacklists suddenly saw the light of day. But you know what that two minute video was that Zach leaked? It's the head of YouTube, the CEO of YouTube, talking to her staff and talking about, this is by the way, early 2017, right after Armageddon Day. And what is she talking about? We are going to refine Google's up next algorithm so that we push up, and then there's a big arrow going up. We push up the content on YouTube that we think is authoritative, and we push down the content on YouTube that we think is not authoritative. That's, do you realize, that's coming straight from the head of YouTube. These, these concerns that we have, okay, they're, they're the tip of an iceberg. Can you imagine what they're actually talking about there every day and what they're actually planning? And can you imagine what they have put in place to impact the 2020 election? Because they have a lot riding on this election. We all do. All right, but... I'm going to finish quickly here. I know. OK, two things. One is monitoring system. I already told you. That's the only way to really get them to back off. And one more thing. It's hard to know company by company what to do. You've seen some recommendations. There is actually one way to take Google down. And I published this the day before I testified before Congress in Bloomberg Business Week. And it's simply to, to turn their index, which is a large database they use to generate search results, into a public common. And when you do that, yes. And by the way, that's very, very light touch regulation. There's precedent for it in law. Uh, the 1957 uh, 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 consent decree with AT&T is an example. There's precedent for it in, business, in Google's own business practices. It will completely change search. It will turn search into media. In other words, there'll be thousands of search platforms all giving very good search results because they're all pulling from Google's index and contributing to Google's index. And each one of those thousands of search platforms will be catering to different audiences like conservatives, like women, like Lithuanians. In other words, it'll be just like media. The media environment is with thousands of newspapers and magazines and TV stations and radio stations. It'll be just like that. In other words, search will be competitive again as it was in the beginning. And you will see tremendous innovation in search. Do you realize there has been no innovation in search? Nothing in 20 years? Nothing. That's the solution to the Google problem. Make their index into a public common. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will open it up for questions. Please make your questions very quick so we can get some good answers and direct them to who you would like on, on the stage. Yes, sir, in the back. In respect to your comments, Dr. Epstein, um, I, I'm, I don't know any other way else to change legislation at the U.S. government, which hopefully we could do that um, if we get a new house. Um, but I filed a lawsuit against Vimeo and Church United on behalf of Church United myself because Vimeo shut us down. And similar to your case, I don't know if you guys will appeal it, but we're appealing to the second court of appeals, which is now conservative. But I don't know any other way to fight this if we don't file lawsuits or change Legis the legislative process and have changed policy to either take down the monopoly and or policy that doesn't immune internet companies from the First Amendment rights, which as of now, they're completely immune to. Okay, Do anybody want to make a quick comment on this? Yeah, so on this issue, I mean, we can continue to sue, right? But I think my issue with Section 230 is that it's become a judicially manipulated statute 
right? It, this, the liability shield was intended to be porous and, and circumstantial, right? It's designed to allow pornographers to get censored. But it's become so interpreted beyond that that it allows everyone to be censored. So, and the courts have interpreted it to be bulletproof to the extent that we never can even litigate the issue. The issue is exactly what they've pointed out. We can't even get to that point because the courts just throw it out. So my feeling on this is that you have to change the statute before we can change how the courts, I mean, we have to give the courts a better statute to interpret. That's gonna take Congress. There's some proposals floating around the Senate and the House right now. Again, we'll do some follow up on it, but we need to focus on this issue. I would just say, I agree with Rachel. Prager, the Prager U against Google slash YouTube is possibly the most famous case on this issue. And if Prager U loses this case, it will set precedent and allow them to basically you know, brush off any other lawsuit. So we need to work on both fronts. Google, Prager is gonna continue to push this lawsuit as far as we can go, but if Section 230 gives them a blanket, uh, you know, okay to do whatever they want, then, you know, what is everybody else gonna do? Keep suing and losing? Yeah, by the way, one last thing on this, no other industry has this kind of protection, mm -hmm. right? Nobody in the, nobody has this kind of sweetheart deal with the government. This is where they make billions of dollars is because of Section 230. There's this misnomer going around that the government isn't involved in tech. Keep tech a free market. The government's involved in tech, guys. <laughs> Section 230 is what makes them billions of dollars. So keep that in mind. Yes, sir. This was an experiment. Brent, while you were showing us your video, I posted it on my personal Facebook page. And instantly, it said, this video has been restricted. <laughs> In instantly. Oh my God. Right there. Really? Wow. Stunning. Uh, Stunning. Who do we have? OK, right uh, the yeah. lady over there? Yeah, Mark Scouse and yeah. Chapman University and Freedom I guess, I guess we can go Mark, and then we'll go with this young lady. I'm sorry. So I just Googled Prager University is. And up came five listings, all from Prager University, one, two, three, four, five. Then underneath it was the Wikipedia listing. Then under that was a Slate article about the lawsuit that you just lost, uh, saying that you were wrong. But right under that was Accuracy of Media saying that you were right. So. Maybe you're having a positive impact. Uh, uh, they're seeing that they're getting a lot of negative press, and maybe they are changing their mind now. That was my experience just doing the Google. I wish. I wish it was the case, but uh, yeah, they're not, they're not changing their minds. I mean, all of these kids that have gone through the college system that you know have been taught that our ideas are equal to the ideas of the Nazis. And by the way, I'm Jewish and so is Dennis Prager. But that's how they came out of the college system and they got all these degrees in diversity studies and fluff studies and whatever. And they all landed jobs at Google and YouTube and Facebook. They think that we are the big villains of our time. It, it's in their ideology. They can't even tell, they get triggered when they see a PragerU video. They think it's so hateful. So it's a, it's, a, it's a big problem. It's a big problem. It's why the work we do at PragerU is so important. It's important that we show them an alternative point of view in a soft and welcoming way so that they realize that what they've been taught their whole life is a really one-sided perspective. That's why the PR... I don't want to only focus on the legal side of it. The PR and the, and, and the public awareness component of exposing Google for what it is and bringing back conservative ideas into the conversation for young people to realize that there is, there is a lie that they've been lied to. They haven't heard another perspective. And once I think the combination of both things is what needs to be done. Um, yeah. I, I have to defer to the cup of the copy, Bill Walton. <laughs> Uh, it seems like one of the things they're doing successfully is they're dividing us all up into separate lawsuits, this, that, or the other thing. We're atomized. Prager's fighting. Oh, many of us in this room are fighting the same thing. Brent, you've led a coalition. Where's that going? Can, what, we can, what can we do to get everybody engaged in this? So instead of just looking at the slides saying, yeah, we've got to do something about 230, we can get the money and the talent and the resources to, to really go at this? Well, we, well, thank you for saying that. Uh, we, we saw this problem coming uh, about four years ago. 
and uh, we, we brought it up to, to CMP and others have spoken about it, but there really wasn't a, a concentrated effort in the movement to do it. So we launched this thing called the Free Speech Alliance, and we invited conservative leaders and conservative organizations to join, and we're up to about 60 now. Uh, that have become part of this. And m my goal is to spin this thing off and, and it, for it to become Free Speech America, uh, where, where this becomes a national concern for the conservative movement. I think Dr. Epstein's right. I think it's beyond the conservative movement, but you know, we'll take the fight with the conservative movement right now. Uh, but I do, I do invite, see, there's strength in numbers. I do invite every conservative leader. Doesn't mean we're all gonna agree on the solution. There's a great debate about what's going on with, with what I happen to agree with Rachel. But there's a great debate on this. That's fine, let's have a great debate on this. I've talked to, we brought in different uh, groups, we brought in religious groups, political groups, publishers, and it's really fascinating what we've learned. But then I brought in the legal groups, oh my God. And, and these were the top legal scholars. They couldn't agree on anything. I mean, it's so complicated, fine. We have to explore it. So uh, very quickly, I do, I do invite people to join the Free Speech Alliance. The more, the better. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Bill, for that. Uh, I hope this isn't a point, but my question is for Dr. Epstein. When you said that about nests, all of a sudden the alarms went off in my head because I just became aware this week that as we get, have service calls on our commercial buildings here in Southern California, the, the reports come back with additional recommendations. And one of them is to um, install a new Nest thermostat. And I'm thinking all over Southern California, all these Southern unsuspecting people who are getting these thermostats, what's the alternative? Dr. Epson? Do you want to answer that? Oh. <laughs> I keep telling you, you don't understand how big this problem is, and that's a wonderful example. I appreciate you bringing that up. But I just want to refer back to what someone said before, who I forgot who it was, who was talking about uh, getting a, a search results for PragerU, right? And, but there was something positive on there, and isn't that a good sign? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that's not a good sign, okay? Because, because of a phenomenon called negativity bias, which we've studied in our research on search suggestions, okay, if they allow even one negative in a list, that draws 10 to 15 times as many clicks as a neutral or positive suggestion, and they know that. That's why in 2016, okay, one of the interesting things that would happen when you typed in uh, Hillary Clinton is on Google, Bing, and Yahoo. Is on Bing and Yahoo, you'd get Hillary Clinton is the devil. Hillary Clinton is sick. Hillary Clinton is. You know, it was all the things, bad things people were searching about. On Google, if in the summer of 2016, if you type Hillary Clinton is, you got two things, just two results. Hillary Clinton is winning. Hillary Clinton is awesome. <laughs> now, no one was searching on those things. You could check that on <clears throat> Google Trends. But the point is, these are tools of manipulation. If they allow even one negative into that list, you're cooked. And they know that. If they allow a positive into it, that means nothing. It doesn't draw clicks. They know so much, and they know about you as individuals. And that's the other problem, because the more they know about you as an individual, the easier it is for them to manipulate you. Thank you. Uh, question over here. Oh, don't, I'm sorry, the mic is over here. I'm sorry. I, Can you I, hear I me? Yeah, please, go ahead. So I got kicked off of YouTube for no reason. Just one day woke up, my whole site was gone. They took every video down. You can't even search for my videos, any of the videos, which I find interesting. But my, my question is this. When I got on these platforms, we were advertising on Facebook, spending money. We built our page, spent hundreds. Now it, it was thousands of man hours. I felt like it was my little island on the page, regardless of what I wanted to say. And we're a snarky group, so we make fun of liberals and, you know, in, in strange kind of ways. And I thought, that's my little place in the sun. And then we started getting all these restrictions, 30 days, seven days in jail, whatever, whatever. And finally, you find yourself just saying, okay, here's what I can get away with and what I can't. But why aren't we suing these people on just the basis of, I paid you money, I have my little place in the sun, it doesn't matter what I say, as long as I'm not threatening anybody, that's, I've paid for this. And I've never understood how we can't go to battle with just that. How, I get, if there's anybody in here that's got a Facebook page and you're like me, 
you have spent thousands of dollars, you have spent tens of thousands of man hours with your staff, putting things up, responding back, like, don't like, laugh it, whatever, and they can just arbitrarily, one day, I, I'm, I'm under threat right we're gonna, now. We got, me, we got to take it over. Out. We got to throw the question over. Yeah, there. well, I, I mean, I agree with you. It's, it, to give you an example of this, it's kind of like, imagine you bought a billboard and then suddenly found out the billboard is right under the ocean. It's basically what they do. That's what shadow banning is. It's like they sell us a billboard and the billboard is actually not to be seen. So we didn't have time to talk about shadow banning, but it's a, it's a big problem. And a bigger problem for smaller content makers like you than for us. We have 7 million followers. We'll reach them somehow, but for smaller conservatives, or not even conservatives, like Dr. Epstein said, smaller groups that this YouTube just decides to removed it's the biggest problem okay. the reason you can't sue is because of terms of service mm -hmm. that you everyone agrees to that no one reads that change constantly and it says it gives them the right to pull down any ad that you've paid for any content you want at their own discretion the reason they can do it section 230 okay yeah we've got we very quickly because we got to go to the action steps sorry, now but I just have to say this. Look, it's not section 230 <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry it's not. And there's nothing Congress can do here that's going to make any difference. And look at the eVentures case that w that w that w where the decision came down in 2017. I followed every aspect of that. I was an advisor on that project for years. eVentures, Google took down hundreds of their websites, just down, blocked, okay? And eVentures sued, and they fought, and they fought, and they fought, and they fought. And the final decision was... It wasn't Section 230, it was First Amendment. So when Google can't hide, or in these other companies, when they can't hide behind, behind 230, they hide behind the First Amendment. There is nothing Congress can do here, nothing. And not only that, let's say Congress came up with, I mean, I, I'm an advisor to, to a number of members of Congress and a bunch of AGs. Yeah, they're all working on all kinds of crazy things, okay? But I'm telling you, they move so slowly and tech moves at the speed of light. Regulation and law will never keep up with the threat that tech poses to humanity. We have to get at this some other way. Thank you. Okay, okay so, so now comes the difficult part. We've got six action items. We have to reduce them to three for tomorrow night. Um, Reed, I don't know how we want to do this because we have the three. The first three are, are or we're coming from Marissa and Craig and the next three are coming from Rachel. I don't know how we can condense these three. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's try to do it. You got three. Uh, well, let's just start here. Looking at those three, are, is there, if we're reducing it down to three, are there anyone here that we want to take out to begin? Support the 50 AGs, urge Congress to reform 230, and more oversight on tech. Anything we want to reduce here so we put the other ones in? Number three. Number three? Take down number three. Anybody else want to suggest something? Two. two. Take out 230. Um, anybody else? That, show of hands of, of take down number three. Are you taking all mine down? Okay. All That's right, it's about a half a dozen. <laughs> take down number what? two. Yeah, they're censoring Rachel. They're censoring, they're censoring Rachel. <laughs> We're censoring number two. How, how many agree with number two? Taking down number two. Okay, about three or four. But there's pushback. There's pushback on that. Is there pushback on that, 230? Okay, is there pushback on number three? Pushback on number three? Yes. Some, okay. All right. Uh, let's go to the first one. Let's go to there. You know, the, that second one, that, that's kind of a blend. So let's go up, read if we can, yet yeah, to these three. Okay, looking at these three, um, which one do you, do you think one or more should be taken down to make room for others? Can you make number one and two the same thing? Uh, and two the number one. Yeah. Why not? I think all three of them can be one. Why? Because they're all about supporting current views, uh, you know, All right, can we reword it then into one big thing? Uh, support, how about if we went support PragerU's public awareness marketing campaign by signing a petition and sharing online? I like it. God, we're brilliant. <laughs> Text on 
Okay. All right. So, 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 so we will, well, I don't know if we have just one on the other one. That's the, that's the issue. No, 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 we had pushback. We had pushback on, 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 on number two, on the other one, on the 230. There was pushback on that. Um, can do you, read, do you want to try to reword uh, so, you know, supporting Prager by signing the petition and sharing? Well, let's 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 do we do we did we solve the first one? Read did we get that one done so we can move to the other ones? Uh, well, we didn't because we wanted to we wanted to no we wanted to put them all into one. Read um, we can work on that afterwards. We can work on that since we've got nine minutes left. But just condensing, I'll work with you on that. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a hybrid of the three. Let's look at the next three. Uh, let's revisit them again. So we've got one big one. We've got room for two more. And that would be any one of these three. And if we want to, as a fourth option, the surveillance. Um, so let's, let's uh, how the hell are we going to do this? Um, which of... Yeah. Do you want? Do you? What do you want? Do you want to? To, Dr. Epstein, do you want to uh, very quickly say what? If you had a bullet point, what would it be on surveillance? What would be your talking point? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Reed, did you catch that? No, but they're not going to do it unless they're legally. You're, they're not going to load. They're not going to do it unless, unless they're legally forced to do it. You know. It's it's not binding on these companies. You have to change. You have to have change. There's no cooperation needed by the companies. Right. Monitoring is done externally. Monitoring but, is done by looking over the shoulders of actual. But I think her point is, you'd have to get into the back door of tech, and they're not going to give you access. Not at all. Also, oh, how is it? How are you, this group specifically going to do it? Yeah, so. that's that's absolutely right. Mercer's making the ask. What the, does this group do? Oh. What should this group do? Is there what? What's an action item we give for for CMP action to do for this for people here to do? Okay. There we go. Okay. All right. There you go. There you go. Uh, urge the White House to issue an executive order establishing oversight. Uh, to, to, to investigate the, the possible threat that big tech, big tech companies pose to the free and fair election. Okay. All right. Urge the president to establish, <laughs> uh, to investigate the threat. Is there the executive order? Is there a specific executive order to to investigate threats to the election? Yes. The what? Right is that what it is? Okay. All right. All right. So it would be urge the president to sign the executive order that is that is a, to to investigate. The, okay. The threat of big company. We had the threat of. Big tech companies to influence the presidential election. I was just toning it down just slightly. Urge the president to issue an executive order. See what I'm saying? We don't want to. You know, we're not supposed to know about. Just to issue an executive order. Okay, cool. Don't you want to get the word manipulate in there somewhere? Yeah. Instead of influence, manipulate. I, I like that. I like that more. To 
issue executive order to investigate threat of big companies to manipulate. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would, well, why don't we just take out the word all altogether? Yeah. Just elections. Yeah. Okay, so we, we just, we nailed one, the urge president. Uh, established systems that, no, no, we've got to go to, that, that, is, that is one read. Uh, the, the second one is the, the three Prager ones put together, which, which you and I can, can work out that one. We'll, and we'll, if you don't want to take the time to put them together, you can just take out your phone now. Right now. Go to PragerU.com, sign the petition, and you could be done with it. And then you can be done. <laughs> let's, well, let's actually have some action. But we, yeah, but, but I, I want to do all three of them. I want to put all, all three right. of them together. You're just messing around. Because uh, they're all right. three. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry? Right, but but that's going afield. I'm so we we want we got to we got to vote on these action items that are there. Um, so we have we have two Dr. Epstein's, and we've got the Prager one, and now we've got to go to the if we can go to Rachel's three, those three. Okay, uh, we've got to choose one here. What which one do we believe is the one that we want to choose? Um, uh, do we do? I think three did not have a lot of support. You can combine those. There's something talking about government. But the 50 AGs, are they investigating other thing other than antitrust? Are they, they're not looking at the 230. No, that's a, that's a statute, so Congress has to change that. So it's, well, it's 51. I thought. It was 50, and then it turned into 51. Okay, 51. Well, technically not a state. <laughs> I don't know. It's like, it's, it's California and like Arkansas are not participating. It reminds me of the time that, reminds me of the time that Ray, uh, what, Raquel Welch was on the old Larry King radio show and she was doing a tour supporting abortion. And he said, what do you want to do? And she said, I'm taking a message to the 52 states. <laughs> and, and he said, well, you mean 50 states in the District of Columbia, don't you? And she said, no, I mean all 52 states. Um, so, uh, 51 state AGs. Okay, so, so we've got to, uh -oh, we got to come up with some, so number three, number three, do we think that's a field and look at one and two? Do we, do, can we agree on that one, that part? So to take out number three. Okay, now I, I want to, I want to, who, who's in charge of this? Um, <laughs> is, it, <laughs> is it Bill? Nah, I'm just a spokesman. I'd like to recommend, please, baby Jesus, can we have all four? Can we have number one and number two? Can we do that? Can we do that? Can I have permission? Do we need a motion? I, do we need a motion? Let's do a motion. I, 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 who wants? There, so move. So, so we're going to do one and two. Uh, no, we're going to do the... Just choose the, uh, just, just the number one and the number two as they were. I think we can keep them that way. And then I'll, I'll work with you and, and, and perhaps if you all want to participate on bringing the Prager one together. And then Dr. Epstein's, and I think we've got all three of them at that point. All four, all four. Um, well, are we, now, yeah, you got me. Uh, yeah, we take out that number two there, and then uh, w one is going to be supporting the, the 51 AGs, and the second one is urge Congress to reform Section 230. Is that, is that the, you yeah. want to keep it there? Yeah. Okay, are we good with that? Okay. Man, we got a minute and 22 seconds. <laughs> All right, how about them caps? Um, okay, so I think... I think we are done. We have one, two, three, and four. And we'll work on All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was good. Thank you very much. Well done. We well were fans done. before, but we're even more fans.